Can you see? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, whether you're watching live or as a recording later on, uh, welcome to the Ripple and Bop show and tell. Over the next hour, we'll be running through some updates on reducing invalid planning application project, known previously as Ripper, and the back office pro planning system project, known as BOPS. Collectively, the name we're now using is Open Digital Planning, and we will explain a bit more about this later. You might have noticed that we didn't have the show and tell last month due to summer break, so we've got a lot to share, especially as we've now gone live with public beta. My name's Hope, and I'm a Digital Transformation Officer at Suffolk, a Plan and Authority, uh, and I'll be introducing today's agenda and taking you uh, taking your questions at the end of the presentation. So for anyone new joining us today, so and tell, the Ripper project is looking to develop new digital services for submitting planning applications and reducing the reasons for incorrect and invalid applications. Uh, this is to improve the service and experience for applicants. The BOPS project is looking uh, to develop a new system for processing planning applications. This is designed by and for planning officers to enable more efficient decision making and open up planning data. Our project vision is uh, to imagine a world where data and digital tools are quicker and easier to use and to provide a better planning services, while also allowing planning officers to focus their expertise. The open digital planning services are being developed collaborative, collaboratively with Lambeth, Suffolk and Buckinghamshire councils, uh, our other partner councils and the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, development and design of the services is led by Unbox Consulting and Open Systems Lab, who you hear from today. And this graph shows the connection between the projects um, and how the internal and public facing parts of each service link together. Uh, we'll explain a bit more about this during the session. So I'll just take you quickly over the agenda. So firstly, um, Tom and Freya will take you through the stock take and road mapping session. Um, Tom will then look at his designer from Unbox, will then look at sign off task list. Raffaella will then go through user testing report for assessment and Tom will just talk about BOPS notification mapping before Evangelos and Richard uh, look at the API for planning history, which is um, site advancement. And then Sam from Suburb. Um, we'll give you some reflections on our Agile training, which now um, quite a few councils have taken part in. And Emily will look at lessons from applicants received, applications received so far. Now we've gone live and we've got real cases. And then Alice is going to take you through a high level roadmap. Um, Jess will look at the improvements to the SEN component, a bit more technical. And then uh, Alistair and Lam, our user researcher, will look at the help button testing. And then finally, we'll go through a tube map of the digital plan and stack. So this is a bit the high level plan for where we want to take this project next. And at the end, we'll do a QA. and a um, So before we get into the main presentation, just to note if you are watching live, uh, we'd love to take any questions you might have. In the right hand of your screen, you should see a box where you can enter your questions and then we'll respond to these at the end of the show and tell. So now I'll hand on to Tom and Freya. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some work we did uh, in in the office altogether, which was very exciting. Um, looking at stock taking uh, on what we've achieved so far and uh, helping just check in on our vision, um, redefining that uh, for the next phase of what we're going to do and also doing a bit of road mapping. Um, and uh, sorry, if we could just return to the stock take, thanks. Um, so the, what the stock take was, was understanding where we, where we are and where we needed to go to 
um, and also doing a bit of prioritisation. So we brought together the POs from uh, that have been involved in the previous phase uh, to help uh, feed into this work and so working as a collaborative team to define this as, as a collective uh, and help us uh, fuel uh, going forwards. Next slide please. One of the things we started by doing was putting together a vision board that helped uh, define exactly what it was that we were hoping to achieve through BOPS. Um, and we did uh, we did this as part of a series of different visual sort of exercises helping um, pull out what it was we were trying to achieve and what that would mean for a whole range of users. So you can see uh, on the image on the left, we've got a vision around delivering data and digital tools that are quicker and easier to use and deliver a, a better uh, planning service that works. And then also we were trying to think about what that means, therefore, for planning staff, for the public, for councils, for policymakers, applicants, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we uh, as a group, came up with various different uh, visions uh, that, or our own ways of talking about that vision grouped them together, extracted the themes and then constructed uh, this vision board that you can you can see. Next slide, please. Um, so following on from that vision, we did some work to really try and translate um, where where we were now, what that vision was and, and what what's the roadmap to getting from from here to there as such. So uh, we did some road mapping where we uh, generated a bunch of things that we knew we needed to do. We prioritized them, looking at what were the sort of easier, what was easier to do, harder to do, what was going to deliver some value, what was going to deliver a lot of value. And then looking at that to try and uh, build this roadmap for now, the next six months, new and the next 12 months and, and sort of in the future up to 24 months. Um, you you can see how this looked in the office, but there's also a version available on Miro, which you'll be able to access through the slides. Um, and this will be a living document, so you uh, check in on it to see see how things are evolving, how things are getting done, and how things the priorities are changing over time. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to talk about the sign-off task list, um, <clears throat> and this is a bit of work we've been doing that's been building on some of the work we did on validation, which you will have seen uh, probably previously, maybe a couple of months ago, and stuff we've been doing more recently around um, the assessing of cases. And we've been borrowing the way that we approach those to help solve this problem. So uh, people who are reviewing cases need to sign off cases in an efficient way and in a correct way. So they need to have all the information to make sure they're making the right decision. And that information needs to be uh, understandable in a way that's quick and, and easy to do. So we, we're aiming to show summaries of the assessment process in a clear, easy to read way. We want to allow uh, the person reviewing a case to make very uh, specific comments about particular parts so that we can improve the the learning speed and, and the feedback speed for between the assessor and the reviewer. And we want to support tracking of changes over time so that people can understand what has happened to their case. They can see um, the, the history of changes that might have taken place. Um, next slide, please. So we are taking an approach that we've used previously, that of having a task list. So that means a series of different tasks that can be uh, completed or checked off. So you can see at the, on the right hand side at the bottom of the screen, we've got this series of blue links with some statuses next to them. So this is what we mean by a task list. This pattern has been uh, sort of well researched and designed across uh, gov.uk design system. And so we're borrowing from that, learning from that best practice. Um, we decided to split it up so there was one task for all the text-based summaries, so where officers are describing the site or um, giving an overall summary. Because that's uh, a lot of that information is um, quite static as, as text, we're allowing the review of that to be done uh, on one page, which helps speed up the process, fewer clicks. And then where we're dealing with different uh, parts of the legislation, different classes, those are done separately because of the, there's quite a lot of complexity that's woven in there. So we've decided to, we, we're aiming to sort of get the fewest tasks, the fewest number of clicks, but the, um, with a manageable amount of information on, on each step of the task list. Next slide, please. 
So you can see this is what the signing off of the text based summaries are. You can see there's a list of different uh, items, summary of works, measurements, site description on the left hand side, and we can see a detail of what this looks like. For each of these, the person reviewing the case has three options. They can accept it, which means they approve that to, to be uh, to sort of go forward. They can edit to accept, which allows them to make minor um, updates to typos or to, uh, to any sort of formatting they want to in the text, or they can return to the officer with a comment where they're able to explain exactly why this item needs reviewing and to show to the, the person doing the assessment that this is something that needs to be changed before the case can be uh, signed off. Next slide, please. And so this is what this looks like from the perspective of someone who's doing the assessment. You can see on the uh, on the right hand side the the items that have been marked to be reviewed. You can see that there's also an edited uh, item which um, still remains as complete. And so what through this, when they go into the item, they're able to clearly see the comment, make any changes they need to. Uh, before resubmitting the case and hopefully getting it signed off in a quick and efficient process. Next slide, please. So uh, the next steps are to keep reviewing these designs with the product owners um, and before we take these through to development and testing. So you can see we've got some of the cards that are on our Trello board, so feel free to check in on the progress on them there and also some of the comments and discussions we're having around this work uh, on the Figma prototyping platform we're using as well. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I'm gonna hand over to Rafaela, who will talk about user testing and research. Good morning, everyone. Yes, my name is Rafaela. I'm a designer from Unboxed, and today I'm going to walk you through uh, the testing phase that we are uh, um, um, working on at the moment for uh, the assessment. So first and, and most important things, uh, why we are doing this. Uh, um, we are we are planning, a pl we are designing a planning system based on user need and it's very important. Uh, so understanding the user need means that we need to have this type of testing. We need to do interview. We need to observe uh, uh, officers uh, and user using the product. The current one, the legacy one, and the and the and the box as well. So uh, we can actually understand the user behavior and make change based on uh, the actual need. So um, what are we doing at the moment? Uh, we are doing a set of interviews, uh, user testing, but we are also going Tom and I to different council to observe uh, uh, officer doing actually the everyday job so we can better understand what type of process they use what are the difference between officer and officer council and council eventually and we can uh, we can better design things and we can tweak things based on uh, actual user behavior so what we are sharing with you today is part of this work so usability testing observation and light feedback is something that we are going to share with you constantly throughout the process. So hope if you can go to the next slide, please. So for example, this is the, um, a, a quick uh, report uh, about uh, our research done on the assessment uh, um, journey. So we test this new approach, the design uh, with 12 officers from seven different council. And uh, um, we look at the overall approach by looking at three specific tasks. And based on the feedback, we have some suggested changes. You can get from the slide deck the link to the full uh, slide deck. And inside of the slide deck, you have further link to the more detailed finding. But uh, I'm going to take you through a few of, uh, few of the slides inside of this deck. So I hope if you can go to the next one. Thank you. So. First and most important, uh, if you are used to, uh, if you have seen Bob's, uh, uh, we have this accordion panel, uh, the opening and closing panel at the very top. And Tom and I, we realized that actually officer really focus a lot of attention on this accordion on two different columns, 70% uh, and 30% uh, split on the on the full page. So. This was kind of an, an issue to us because sometimes 
they are really going into the deep uh, level of the information ahead of starting the the actual process and actual work that they need to do and and the step by step you by using the step by step process so if you go to the next slide i hope uh, what we are proposing is actually to rearrange the accordion so the accordion are going to remain in place of course because contain a lot of useful information but we are thinking about uh, splitting the accordion in a, in a different type of a way. So the accordion that are relevant at the application level are going to be presented at the application landing page, which is the screenshot that you have on your left. So the, the, the one called application landing. And also we are thinking about the process by observing them. We realize that what they need to do first is understand the task list, so validation assessment and review, and then going into the detail of uh, the key application data, the content information, the audit log, the notes. Also, we are uh, putting um, more evidence on the close uh, and cancel application, which was previously uh, just a link uh, at the bottom of the right hand column. We are also providing an option to um, and a redesign option to uh, have a different type of approach at the validation landing and the assessment landing. So at the validation landing, the checklist is self containing a lot of the information, a lot of the information that are currently inside of the accordion. So what we are proposing is to have just a small amount of accordion, this time provided at the top of the page because the user are accessing this type of information before going into the checklist as well as the assessing assess, assessment landing you can compare actually the three pages side by side because are marked with the um, with the purple border and you can see the difference among them uh, because of course during the validation the need is mostly about uh, understanding the application information the proposal detail and the document but at the assessment landing we actually need to go through far more deeper information like the sitemap the constraint pre-assessment outcome, which was previously called uh, um, information from API user or REPA and was unclear. So we changed that label as well. The proposal detail, the consultation and the document. We rearranged the, the order of the accordion panel, uh, the opening and closing panel, because uh, again, we observed the user and we thought about what is the most logical things from the process perspective. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, we are focusing on uh, the structure and uh, the task. So what we are proposing is to move things around. So instead of having the accordion at the top and having the user always focusing the attention on the top of the page, which is a completely normal behavior for every one of us, we are suggesting to swap things around. So we are using the gov.uk task list. You can find the link on this slide as well, and you can see the small uh, example on the top right. Uh, so we are moving the validation assessment and review, and we are also numbering it. So to make more clear that uh, is actually the process where the application are going to be uh, looked through, and the detail are going to move down uh, together with the cancel and uh, close application button. Next slide, please. So this one was another very important task that we tested over the last few weeks and is about uh, the permitted development rights removed. So what we originally designed was a couple of pages, one about condition and one about Article 4. And as you will see from the um, percentage of success of this task was completely unsuccessful. So what we designed was totally not working for the user that we um, we tested. Uh, so we completely changed the type of approach uh, because the officer didn't connect uh, that the condition section was useful for this task. They were always focusing on the history and, uh, and the constraint. So if you go to the next slide, this is what we are actually proposing. So we combine history and condition, history condition and article for check under a page called permitted development right. And inside of the screenshot that you will see on the top right, you we, we are going to provide the, the constraint that are actually coming from the um, submitted application and can be edited 
on the specific condition page. We are also providing the planning history information that can be edited inside of the planning history page. And we also ask the, the user the specific question uh, if the permitted development right has been removed for the specific type of application. This question is actually triggering uh, um, a status change, which is only informational for the for the officer. So if the answer to this question is yes, then the status is going to be displayed as removed. If it's, the answer is, is no, it's going to be uh, displayed as checked. And the interesting thing is that it's not that is not like that. This page is changing entirely the um, workflow. So any for each and every council, they can go through each and every step after this one, despite um, the fact that eventually the recommendation is, is to refuse the application. But we are also providing um, an indication that the application need to be refused if the permitted development rights are going to be removed. Next slide. So next step, um, you can see here uh, some of the Trello card because 70% uh, of the findings are already inside of the Trello board as development task are going to be prioritized as being already prioritized by, by the POs and some of them are already in progress with the developer. 30% of the finding need more design and content work because, for example, we are thinking about working on with Rosanna and Freya and, uh, and the rest of the team on uh, um, mapping out all the status, understanding what are the best label in certain type of situation. And uh, that's all for uh, the final So next, yeah. Next slide is stop. Yes. Uh, so if we go back one, hope just to the notifications. Yeah. This I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague uh, Ben, who's unfortunately uh, unable to make the call today. Um, but uh, Ben uh, spent some time putting together a map of when. Um, we trigger notifications from bots. So in, this is things that we are sending out via email or text to to users of the system, and mostly that is applicants. Um, <clears throat> so there's a map of this showing mostly these relate to sort of validation processes, but there are some things around receipt and decision as well. And we've also created a single file with all the notification content, and this helps uh, provide a really useful resource for new partners but also partners using it to really understand we are saying to people at different steps of the process and this um, just helps provide a bit of clarity because previously we kind of had various versions of notifications in, in a Google Drive so this is um, helps just bring into line and provide a really a useful reference to understand the content and and the timing of the information that we're sharing with users of the system. Uh, I will hand over to uh, Richard and Evangelos for the next slide. Hello, my name is Richard. I'm a new developer on the project from Unboxed. I've been working with Evangelos on planning history. Planning, his planning officers need the history of previous planning applications for a property to make a proper assessment. The information is not available to bots currently. And we're developing a way to make planning information available through an API. Next slide, please. An API provides a standard way of making the data available to anyone granted access. Working on a process, we're working on a process to make it available with one council, and after we'll be expanding the data to new councils. Okay, hand it back. Sorry, we need the, the next slide, please. Hope the previous one. So uh, last month we had an in-person training day at Southwark for Agile training. Um, 
all the digital officers, digital transformation officers at Southwark attended, as well as some other team from Lambeth and DLUC. Um, throughout the day, we learned about the different methods of Agile and how we can use that in our work. At the start of the day, a lot of us said that we work in an Agile way without having the knowledge behind it. So we took part in hands-on activities to understand these methodologies. We spent time relating the methods back to our own projects. Um, this has had an impact on our sprints relative to our timeframes to make sure that we can keep working in the best way that we can. We all sort of felt like we left with a better understanding of our roles and how to get the best out of our work. Over half of the council partners have all now had uh, this formal agile training. Thank you, Hope. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Hadley. I'm from the digital planning team at Buckinghamshire Council, and I'm going to be kicking off the updates on the reducing and valid planning applications part, uh, starting off with lessons that we're learning from applications received so far. So um, in Buckinghamshire, we've uh, so far received 14 LDC applications. Uh, this means these are real uh, residents who have used the service uh, to submit an application. Um, to put a little bit of general overview about these, um, all, we've found so far that all of these applicants are uh, resident applicants. This means they're not using a planning agent. Um, this is quite different from what we usually see. We'd usually see particularly householder um, applicants using planning agents, but none of our testers have done that so far. Um, so. Encourage you some really good learnings about um, people feeling able to make applications themselves or at least having the freedom to make applications themselves. Um, all of the applications received have been prospective projects, so what we call LDCP. This means it's for projects that someone wants to do in the future. Um, a lot of the properties have been rural, so I've just included a little snippet of the map there of the rough sort of application distribution. Uh, Buckinghamshire is a very, very big county with quite a large rural areas, so it's been really good to see kind of rural properties um, and uh, rural applicants using the service. And uh, in terms of sort of projects, um, the, the vast majority have been householder projects. These are works that someone will be doing to their house, in, in particular installing solar panels, as well as conversion projects. So that could be like changing a loft, changing a garage or an outbuilding. Um, we have recently received one change of use application um, from a commercial property to residential. So it'd be good to see how the content of that changes. And the graphic up in the top right is just to show a very broad comparison, which is a few days out of date, but just showing the kind of comparison between the applications we're receiving via the new system versus the current system, which is the planning portal. So quite a few applications to work with. Really great to see people using the service um, and lots of findings from that. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to go over some of the observations we found from these cases so far, which are telling, teaching us quite a lot about applicant behaviour using the service. Uh, so first of all, we're finding that draw site outline is being used over location plans, which is really great. Um, so for anyone who's not used the service before, we're trying to move away from uh, PDF or document location plans, which are required on all apps applications um, and instead of um, asking people to submit drawings which have additional requirements for example needing north arrow scale bars etc we invite participants to draw the uh, the, the red outline as data um, and form for polygon and we found people have been doing that um, which is really great because hopefully that means we can eliminate some of those um, issues that are leading to invalid applications however one thing we are finding is um, Whilst a lot of applicants have been having um, have, have been able to use a tool, uh, I think there still needs to be some further work done on helping people to draw to identify the area they should be drawing. So I've just included some examples at the top, and what this is sort of telling us is that. Um, applicants are trying to select the area where the works are being done, um, which under legislation is correct. Um, but unfortunately, what it can mean is, um, is uh, imagine it's first of all, quite quite hard to draw that. Some of these are very you know technical areas of someone trying to draw exactly where a solar panel is going to be. Fit. So maybe we can provide some better better guidance on uh, making sure that people are drawing um, the correct red line. Um, and also we're finding some uh, issues with the drawing tool. So the 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 outline on the left looks to be where someone has partially um, drawn an outline and maybe closed it too early. So it's cut across the property. Um, unfortunately, this would be an invalid boundary. So a good opportunity for us to take a look at our guidance and make sure we're instructing applicants accordingly. Second thing we've been observing is quality issues on drawing. So we've known throughout the entirety of this project that whilst we may be able to design out a lot of issues and common mistakes, we may not. That one of the things we'll always probably struggle with is, is drawings and particularly like the quality issues on drawings. Um, so I've uh, just included two examples here of things we've we've received, and um, I, uh, it's 
we have tried to put together some guidance to try and help applicants put the right drawings together um, but unfortunately some of these are still missing some things that we would need for example measurements and scales etc but it definitely looks like these applicants are looking at this guidance and trying to kind of draw plans accordingly so I think that's still a step in the right direction um, this will just help us uh, focus our attention on on where to improve that guidance um, thirdly, so select the works um, is turning out to be a very helpful thing. So um, again, would really encourage anyone to try out the service, which is now live in the form of Find Out for New Planning Permission and also the Apply for Lawful Development Certificate service. Um, select the works is kind of the, the shopping list of all projects you want to do. And it seems people are really um, are using that effectively and um, is helping them to, to submit the right information. So we're finding the right questions being answered, the right documents are being asked for, which is which is really great. Another benefit of this is what we're finding is actually live use is helping us to identify errors in flows. So flows are kind of the sequence of questions, of someone who's doing a project. Um, so we've seen from some of these live cases, um, some uh, perhaps a few errors that we'd found um, are now being picked up. So for example, we, we recently found through one of the live services that there was a question um, that was being posed to the users that, uh, that resulted in the wrong fee being requested. Um, so it's really great that we've now found this issue so we can go and fix it, um, as well as um, helping us to identify issues with like other questions, maybe with the way uh, maybe someone's being sent down the wrong route, etc. And the last sort of observation is less about kind of applicant behaviour and more about our processing is um, at the moment when we receive applications, uh, we have to kind of process it in our current back office system as well as testing with the uh, with the um, back office planning system that we're currently developing. And that is resulting in quite a lot of workarounds and particularly like um, what we're calling housekeeping um, of documents where we have to kind of prepare them and make sure that they can be viewed in the current system and it's quite tricky and quite time consuming um, even though it's been really great to be able to test test this new way of working is it's, it's quite hard when you're working with multiple systems that don't Kind of rely on the same level of information so um, we're making sure to collect all that feedback from staff who have been handling this new type of application um, and try and uh, inform prioritization of, of the back office process um, and of course we'll be uh, looking forward in the future to more applications coming in and more live use so that we can um, make further changes um, of the product so that's my update i'll now pass over um, to possibly open systems lab yeah, thanks Emily um, and apologies in advance if um, we have some connection issues with slightly more remote than usual. Um, so yeah, just uh, kind of to start off um, with a sort of broad overview, obviously uh, with the public uh, beta services now live, um, something we've been focusing on is just having the kind of uh, stepping back and identifying what our priorities are for this for this next phase. And obviously one of the big sort of top level backgrounds uh, priorities is really constantly scrutinizing everything about how the services are now being used and looking for every possible way that we can find to rapidly learn um, and and so every time anything that happens which isn't very good we work out right we've got to learn from that what's going to be the improvement to that so it's worth um, just uh, stopping for a moment and just having a look at this which is basically a kind of a quick list of all the different sources of input that we have so um, I won't go through all of them but essentially it's a mixture of um, logging the cases and seeing right are they valid or invalid if they're invalid why are they invalid and we so we're, we're getting good quality data about that um, and uh, also getting feedback directly from users of course as well as the user research that, that LAM is continuing to do, as well as um, office, getting the, the, the testing from officers, in, particularly in terms of like, all oh, right, is the data that's coming through any good or you know, could it be improved, as well as analytics as well. We were going to talk a bit more about analytics today. We're not going to do that today. We'll talk a bit more about that next time, but um, obviously that's a kind of superpower to be able to get more and better analytics all the time so we can see how users are using the services because the proof is in the pudding there's you know that's almost the best kind of evidence you can get is to see what people really do and where they really struggle okay next slide please um uh, oh back back again there we are thank you um so uh that was just one of the kind of things of this phase so if uh, it's worth going and check checking this document out the link is um on ripper.digital and it's also you'll be able to get it through these slides um, and these are out there. So we have this um, high level roadmap. So we have very detailed roadmaps of the design and development we're doing, but this is a high level road, roadmap um, and it's a good place to just check in on the project and say, right, what are 
you know, what are we working on in this next phase? What do we see as the pro main agendas and priorities of this phase? And broadly speaking, it's, as I said, improving the imp experience for everyone. That means applicants and officers and looking for every, every possible way that that can be done. But also we'll be moving ahead with some of the kind of bigger ticket design and development items, such as introducing pages so that the service feels much nicer to navigate um, and things like that. Um, and also, of course, uh, one of the things we will be doing um, at some point in this phase is um, a good test of the kind of modular reusable approach that we've taken to all the code that we've built. So we've built what we've been building using the PlanX platform is almost like Lego, Lego blocks. And, and one of the ways that we can prove how useful it is to take this kind of Lego like approach is by rapidly using the same components to build other planning services and what and the first planning service that we're going to try test out that theory on is apply, apply for prior approval so yeah all that to look forward to next slide please um so yeah and i'm going to hand over to jess who's going to talk a bit about one of those um immediate ways that we've been learning from what's going wrong um and immediately diving into working out uh, ways to improve it Exactly. So this diagram represents sort of the final stages of an application, which are arguably the most important stages, which is for an LDC application, a user will often pay a fee <laughs> and then that application is going to be submitted. Um, right now we are submitting to multiple systems, which is the back office planning system and uniform, um, which is a legacy case management system in place at many of our councils. <laughs> um, and then the user will see a confirmation page. And what we've been learning in public beta is that the steps between pay and confirmation <laughs> have quite frankly been quite buggy. <laughs> and we're learning from those bugs and basically trying to minimize the gap between what happens between pay and confirmation and make sure we can be as smart and clever about how we handle those as possible. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Great, so one of the errors has been that um, when an applicant pays, they fully leave their application and they go to the GovPay website and then they will come back to their application. This, if you think about it, is actually very similar to you leave your application because you're saving and then you return a few days later. Um, and we need to be able to distinguish the difference between those. Uh, previously, we were showing the user the same sort of review your answers page, but we knew that this was confusing and led to some misinterpretations and folks exiting early. <laughs> um, so they would get their go pay email confirmation and then they would sort of see this like receipt of like review your answers before you continue on. And they maybe misinterpreted that as a confirmation and exited early. And this was an error because their application was not sent in their session. <laughs> We have ultimately been able to submit all applications successfully in public beta. I think this is important to note. It's just like uh, while we have had user facing errors, we are very confident in sort of the session data that we've been collecting and storing and we've always been able to ultimately successfully submit. <laughs> uh, but this is a really known error. So next slide, please. So our first fix has been to remove that sort of review page altogether, specifically after the pay step. And so we can see this gap getting a little bit smaller. Now you're paying. We're still sending to sort of both destinations and the user is sort of seeing that as a loading spinner and waiting for those to complete. And then they're seeing a confirmation page. Next slide, please. <laughs> this was still very imperfect because our sends are sort of reliant on each other. So uh, if the first one fails, the second one can't move on. If the second one is timing out, we're still not seeing a confirmation page. Next slide, please. Exactly, and we knew that this was, it was causing some folks were just having browser timeouts. Users would close their tab before. Um, Ascend here could also fail just because one of the external systems that we're connecting to disconnects. It can be sort of both sides can fail. Uh, so we want to minimize that um basically our goal is that the user shouldn't have to know about those <laughs> we should be able to handle all of that behind the scenes now so next slide please oh, there we go thank you <laughs> um so what we 
have done in recent weeks um, is introduce what we call a messaging queue that rather than asking our users to wait for these send requests to complete, all they are waiting for is for us to create a little trigger that just says this application should be sent to BOPS and it should be sent to Uniform or it should be sent to any place else that our content editors want to like compose in their service. We really want to maintain that flexibility, right? <laughs> um, and so the user only waits for this send trigger to complete and then in the background, our message queue can immediately kick off these send events. They can happen in parallel now rather than being reliant on one another and they have better built in retries so that if they're failing, the user never knows that will be automatically retrying in the background until it succeeds and the user immediately sees a confirmation page. Next slide, please. <laughs> so yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, we know that there, uh, as we sort of continue to iterate on this problem, we're sort of like sunlighting bugs still in new places or sort of like still pain points that are happening. We still know that this step of recovering session data um, is quite computationally expensive. <laughs> and uh, so that's sort of like the developer problem and the user problem for that is that quite frankly, it's slow to load, <laughs> especially if you're on a slower internet connection. Um, and we know that one of the results of this is you may confusingly, when you come back from pay and your service is trying to catch up of where you're supposed to be in the service, <laughs> It may accidentally show you the first question really briefly first before it sort of jumps you over to that confirmation page. Next slide, please. All right. So the next piece of work that we're planning to sort of continue iterating on this is taking better advantage of the GovUK API that we use and trying to sort of send information like as a pass through of where you're at in the flow so that we know quicker when you come back where you should be. <laughs> Help make that less computationally expensive. <laughs> um, and similarly, make sure there's just like better user feedback and either like a clear message or a much clearer loading indicator that avoids possibly seeing like the first question like you did before, which indicates perhaps that like the service has ended and we don't want that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I will pass over to Lam now. Cool, thanks, Jess. Um, so, hi, um, I'm Lam. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the many content changes uh, the team, particularly uh, Alice, uh, has made uh, this brief. And um, so, yeah, during the last uh, couple of weeks, we have been testing quite heavily on the uh, save and return functionality of Ripper together with the uh, notification emails that we send to our users. Uh, this includes uh, emails such as application saved, uh, reminder email, as well as uh, expiry email. When we test this email initially, uh, one of the first thing we observed uh, was that these emails often look very similar at first glance uh, with no clear subject line. Uh, this, uh, this makes it unclear to users uh, as what these emails are about. It also makes uh, sifting through and finding the correct email to action on harder uh, when users need to do so later on. Um, so also, uh, other if all user noticed um, the submission deadline on um, the email, it wasn't always clear to them that the draft application will be deleted if they fail to submit it by the deadline. Uh, and they only get to find out about that when they receive a reminder email, which is seven days um, before the submission deadline. So uh, in order to improve this, uh, we have now added bold and clear subject line for each email type. Uh, these are self-explanatory um, uh, short phases such as continue your application for the reminder email and your application has expired for the expiry email to let user know immediately what the email is about. We also make sure we explained earlier on, starting from the application saved email, um, that application will be deleted if they do not complete it by the application deadline, which is plenty more time ahead of the application deadline, as opposed to only find out about that seven days before the deadline. Uh, next slide, please. 
helpful. And when some users would prefer to have another reminder email sent to them 24 hours before the uh, application deadline on the original uh, expiry email, some comment that they assume the application information will still be available somewhere, even though on the email it says um, your data will be deleted. Uh, as uh, some users understood that only the personal data will be deleted, um, but the uh, uh, draft application uh, is still available somewhere else. So on the expiry email, uh, to improve that, we changed the sentence from for your protection, your data will be deleted to your data will be deleted and you will not be able to continue with your application to make sure that user understood uh, they will no longer have the access to the draft application at this point when they receive the expiry email. Next slide, please. So um, besides the content improvement uh, we've made on the notification emails, uh, other items we have improved on is also the uh, help button. Um, one of the most feedback area from user testing is comments around the help button. The help button is currently illustrated as a question mark icon located at an arm's length uh, to the right hand side of the main question of most of the pages of the report service. It provides information such as why we are asking uh, applicant the question we are asking in relation to planning, uh, how some of the terms are being defined, uh, instruction on how to use or navigate tasks on the uh, page, and source links to planning registration, etc. etc. Uh, while well, user feedback to us uh, that these are all very well written and uh, health, helpful information, most of the users uh, tend to miss the help button uh, initially and they only find out about um, their additional information and click away until several questions into the surface. Uh, some suggest us to have the help text expanded automatically so that they don't uh, miss any important information. Also, uh, while the team agree that it is unnecessary to have help button on all report uh, question pages. However, uh, it is uh, important to identify uh, pages where users do need additional help information for. And on that note, I'm going to pass on to uh, Alistair to talk us through some of the proposed changes he has been uh, experimenting to in improve the help button. So over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Lam. And I'm going to try and uh, take the risk of sharing my screen and we'll see whether that, uh, how well that works. So um, yeah, this is one of those kind of um, quite small design details, but actually it makes a big difference to people. So it's quite kind of nice to really sweat it. And so we've been sweating some different ways we could um, we could do that. Um, oh, actually, this is full screen here. This is immediately gone very well. Oh dear. Escape key doesn't work. Okay, fine. Um, so, uh, oh, excuse me. I've got to. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> oh. OK, maybe we'll abandon the screen sharing idea. Maybe. Uh, goodness. Oh dear. <laughs> Don't even know how well I've done that. Um, OK, fine. Um, so. Um, Apologies for this. What do I do here? Ah, hold on. We're, that's fine. We, we've rescued it. Thank you. Um, cool. So what we're just doing is mocking up three little uh, kind of mock-ups for different ways we might do do this ever so slightly differently. So one idea um, is simply instead of having an icon at all, simply having a word called help, and that pulls the a sidebar open. Okay, that might be interesting. Uh, we'll see if we we're just seeing the word help. Uh, helps a bit. Another very, very small tweak that we'll probably make is making the actual sidebar that opens a bit wider. And particularly our agenda there is about making any images that are attached to the help text a bit more information, uh, a bit more visible. So Emily mentioned earlier about how one of the things we'll really struggle to uh, uh, kind of make kind of make a big dent on potentially is drawings, but actually one of the things that we, we do do is have guidance drawings which give examples of what a drawing needs to look like. So it, that will help make those examples a bit bigger um, when having questions like that. So hopefully some more change that might make a difference. Another idea is actually to adopt the pattern closer to how gov.uk do this on their components. 
so they when they're using um help text they put it what's called in line so effectively you sort of open it up in an accordion in in line like this that's quite nice um in the sense that it comes immediately sort of expands the thing that you're working on um the reason we didn't do that originally is because we we think that was probably designed for sort of two or three lines max of of help text and obviously with these planning services the, the help can sometimes be quite a bit longer than that um but this isn't actually too bad um and but it might be a bit onerous when we have um pages and so, so and have multiple questions on one page but nonetheless we've mocked it up and we will test it and see what users think of it and the third option I, oddly enough is when we're testing this house offices sometimes you kind of come back closer to something where near where you started it's simply the idea of making the help button uh, larger and more visible uh, and this um so the same idea of a sidebar but simply using a different more um link uh, same color as links um icon and this might be something that we can make consistent across some of the other components bigger components that we're going to be building um in the near future so we don't know exactly um what the answer to that question is but as ever hopefully um users I do know and will and will know so um we're gonna thanks to lam we're gonna be taking those out and, and testing them the links um uh, to those mock-ups are going to be there on the slides as well so if anyone fancies just having a little play with them um and send us your opinions um that would be marvelous as well um and then very finally jumping from a very very small detail to a very very big picture um it, We've been working on something together with with uh, uh, everyone really, um, which we've kind of called a tube map of digital of digital planning ecosystem. So this is really building off the back of a piece of work that um, uh, the BOPS team had really started, which is building this kind of detailed service blueprint. And we sort of joined in that. And we said, well, it should be really, really helpful to have a kind of high level version, a bit like the tube map that allows us to see the kind of big picture of the entire digital planning ecosystem so this is very very much pulls heavily on a piece of work that was done quite a good decade or so i think now um ago by the team um early on at, at the government digital service gds called government as a platform where they really conceptualized the idea that to build the kind of digital really effective digital government that we want we had to think of it as a kind of stack of lots of different interoperable pieces all connected together share, sending their data to and from each other and so those pieces range from public facing services and we know there's loads and loads of planning services for example like um apply for planning permission find out if you need planning permission apply for prior approval etc cetera, etc cetera. um to these sorts of deep at the bottom of the thing of, of 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 the system these sorts of of data registers which are these kind of canonical stores of of information like maps or things like the land registry or um things like that and so we can in between those things we can think of the digital planning ecosystem that together we're collectively trying to create in these sorts of um this interconnected system supported by these different platforms these different layers and each one of these layers um has at least a kind of one um in piece of digital infrastructure um supporting it so and this is a way of understanding it so if we kind of think of just quickly run through these layers um, and again this is published online so i'm not going to go into too much detail um but if you think through these these uh, layers we've got um services which are seen by members of the community and wider public we've got applicant facing services we've got the um the bops and things that the, the planning officers see um a digital planning register we'll come back to that in a moment digital land so this is a platform for aggregating and uh, dispensing all of that incredibly valuable data about um land about places so conservation area outlines and things like that Built, and then below that a bunch of uh, platforms which we're using which are not necessarily involved in the open digital planning program but uh, things like of course gov.uk pay gov.uk notify upon which all of these services are also um, built um, because we're using and then from the left to the right we've got the sort of the journey of a typical planning application of course all different plan all planning applications are different but an application for a certificate of lawfulness is different for example um to an, an application for planning permission but they have certain generic features um which uh you know are all similar 
such as you know finding that service at the beginning you know most journeys on the internet tend to start at google um through um kind of filling out your information and adding your name uploading your drawings paying and then it's getting sent to bops um but then it's going to be going through the process of validation and consultation uh, and oops um and all the way through then later to appeal some of the parts that we haven't really looked at we haven't really got to um that hard yet this exercise is really really helpful because it helps us sort of step back and get a clear understanding of what are the different roles of the different pieces of infrastructure and what's needed where are the gaps um, if we're going to make a really fantastic all the way through end-to-end -end data data driven planning system and one of the gaps that immediately leapt out to us um, is that actually at the moment we have these product teams for um, the, the public facing digital planning services supported by Plan X. We have the, the back office planning system, but there's a really um, clear need also for a digital planning register. And this is something that has been on people's radar for a long time. And um, there's been some lots of really interesting studies, kind of early studies done about it. And it, it, this feels like, you know, this is going to be the future of where this is going is um, building a um, a, a digital piece of infrastructure which will serve as that store of data of all um, planning applications at, at different stages at different points in their journey. So um, uh, it's worth it said we've linked to it here this is a big Miro board and um, this will be a continuous live evolving document rather like the tube map itself uh, of the London Underground. Um, and um, do go and have a look and sort of put comments on it and things like that. But um, hopefully it's it's useful when entering into a new territory to begin to draw a map um, so that you know where you are and where you're going next. And also I think hopefully what helps to communicate is the bridge between having the, the bigger vision of the digital uh, transparent planning system that we're trying to create and the the kind of the modular way that we're building it so to make useful pieces of it and then be continually adding and improving it and that is us thank you Hello, so thank you for everyone that's presented today so um so just gonna see if we've got any questions from uh our watchers today yeah, thanks, Hope. Um, so we do have four questions. Um, I can't see the chat box for this call, so I'm just going to read them out, but I'll read it out twice if anyone needs me to repeat it. So I'm just going to read them in the order they came in. Um, so the first question was, um, how were applicants encouraged to use the new submission system? How was this advertised? So I think that's just about the public beta launch and how we informed agents and applicants about that. I suppose we could just take it in turns. <laughs> so, so I'll start off with uh, with with B for Buckinghamshire. Um, so uh, we didn't kind of do too much. About, at the moment, uh, the service is available on on the council's website, kind of as an alternative uh, to current methods of submission. So, um, if someone is looking at Buckinghamshire web pages to do lawful development certificates, they may see a link to the service that says you can try out this new tool here. Um, and uh, just in the Buckinghamshire area, we also did a local press release just talking about the, the launch of the public beta, both, both for find out if you need planning permission and for the lawful development certificate service. And then also um, a delegate also out some comms advertising as well. So um, we haven't gathered um, uh, exactly from applicants how they how they found out about the service. That might be something we want to take forward um, to just uh, ask people how they found out and that might help us um, uh, with future kind of comms things. Um, Pass to someone from Lambeth to talk about what Lambeth have done. If anyone from Lambeth on the call? Maybe we haven't got anyone from Lambeth, but I think that's other. We did a very similar process to Bucks. Um, so we had a list of agents that submitted LDCs in the last year. So we sent them all messages with the link and explained the benefits of using RIPA. Um, there's also going to be a press notice in the next copy of Suffolk News this month. So that'll actually be a print ad. Um, and we have also been doing every two weeks, we've just been checking in with any new agents that haven't submitted LDCs to us in the past, just to see if they were aware of RIPA and why they chose to use the planning portal if they didn't use RIPA. 
Cool. Um, so the next question, will you be sharing those high level findings coming out of this somewhere easy for others to look at? And as for Emily, so I think that links back to the slide that you did about the cases at Bucks. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm probably at the moment show and tell seemed like a really good format for us to just sort of trickle through those findings. But definitely as a project, I imagine we're going to want to have a think about how we kind of distill these findings. Um, most of our uh, project trellos are public, so that's like a, a good way to kind of see how these pieces of feedback end up in some things. I can also see Matt, you've put your hand up, so maybe you have something a bit more, a bit more official than than my my comments. I wouldn't say official. Um, um, hi there, um, my name's Matt. I work at um, the Luck. Um, we've currently got a piece of work on ongoing around um, communications and content strategy and a lot of that is going to be thinking about um, improving the ways that we are sharing what we're learning with people beyond just the show and tells um, and another update. So yeah, for those of you that are following along, do expect more structured ways to keep in touch with things and um, opportunities to kind of catch up with things on a more regular basis or maybe less frequently if you don't have the time for doing that. We want to make sure that we're catering for different different audiences and needs because we know how busy everyone is in the sector at the moment. Great, thanks Matt. And then the final two questions also include comments, so some feedback. So someone said they loved the idea of having the word help nice and easy to see and bold. Um, and they said, would it be worth having both the icon and the help word? Would that be clearer or would that be too confusing? So it's kind of a comment and a question for that one. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's an interesting. We should try that. <laughs> Great. Um, and I think this might be from the same person. This next comment, they said the large bold question mark with advice appearing from the right looked clearer but they look forward to hearing the results of what users think. So we could follow up on that maybe in the next show and tell about user feed feedback from Ripper. Um, so that is all our questions. So I'll pass back to Hope just to um, close us out for the day. Um, I have some issue sharing my screen since it's been, since it's been started. Um, but anyway, without the slides. Um, so yeah, this is everything from us and thanks for being here today. Um, we just wanted to let you know that the next show and tell will be on the 12th of October at 10 a.m. same time as usual. And also some of the project team will be attending local Gov Camp in Birmingham, which I believe is the 29th. Um, so uh, let us let us know if you're there and like come speak to us so we can uh, have some more like informal discussions about the project and also the contact details should be on the next slide if you want to reach out um, to one of our, all of our contact, uh, partner councils otherwise thanks again for your time and I hope you join us for the next one. Okay, see you, have a good day.